Thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful. We forgot to mention that uh, for the first time visitors who turn in the cards in the back, I think the prize this week is going to be you get to see Pastor Matt's slideshow about Ohio. Uh, <clears throat> not sure. <clears throat> well, last week, hopefully you were here and you heard John teach how that we are living stones in a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And all of that was so that we can proclaim his glory. This week's passage, as Peter continues, it's in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 on, he's telling us how to live that life. Uh, we're to live in submission to authorities. We're to live as, as servanthood to God and to others. And we're called, I don't like this part, but we're called to sorrows and unjust suffering. If you would, stand with me as we begin at 1 Peter 2, verse 13. It's God's holy word. It's inspired. It's inerrant. And it's infallible. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin you are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word, and, and we know indeed and confess that we have strayed. And Lord, we get caught up in the world, that we get caught up and our own beliefs, that we're not honoring those that you have put in authority over us. Lord, we pray that today that your word would pierce our hearts, that it would change us, it would bring us to a time of repentance, that it would draw us closer to you. For we ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, <clears throat> when I was in college, which was a really, really long time ago. I had a friend who tried to talk me into a blind date with his girlfriend's roommate. And my friend described her, because I was so shallow, the first thing that came out of my mind is what she looked like. And he described her as out of this world. So what I pictured in my mind was just, some absolutely a beauty beyond compare. But after meeting her, I wasn't so sure that she really wasn't from another galaxy. Uh, and it wasn't just her looks. I think we got a picture of her. Uh, <clears throat> but she didn't make any sense. She kept wringing her hands and saying, my precious, my precious. 
If you're a first time visitor, I'm joking, okay. Uh, Peter had just written in verse 11, which is before our passage, uh, that we were sojourners and exiles. In other places in Scripture, we referred to as aliens. And Paul writes in Philippians 3 that our citizenship is in heaven. And hearing this, seeing the world around us and being under constant attack for what we believe, our temptation is to separate us from the world, uh, to ignore worldly leaders and just dismiss them. That's not what God's plan is for us. We're to live in submission to authorities. Peter writes this in verse 13. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him. So even if we're called to live differently from the world, we are still to obey the laws and to show honor and respect to the leaders of the world. And Peter emphasizes that we do this for the Lord's sake. That's, that's a struggle sometimes. I mean, you see who is in leadership on different occasions. It's hard for us. Uh, and you might even get at the point because you see the world as being so evil that you say that was fine for them back then, but it really it couldn't apply to us now. But Peter lived in a world that was dominated by slavery. There was incredible abuse. Uh, they murdered their children. Uh, there was all kinds of sexual sin and homosexuality ran rampant. Uh, they lived in a, in a really wretched, rotten, vile, wicked society just like ours. Just like ours. And yet... God commanded them to submit themselves, to be subject to the authorities because those authorities were ordained by God. Peter wanted to be sure that they understood that they must not only just obey the laws, but they had to honor and show respect to the rulers. I can hear some of you thinking, okay, that's difficult. Uh, and, you know, I argue with this. I struggled with this this week. And I think of uh, Jesus saying in Matthew 13, 22, and I believe that's when he's talking the parable of the soil. And he says, The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So if the cares of this world choke out God's word, why shouldn't we just avoid the world? And, and like some uh, different religious groups have done, just separate ourselves from them completely. Uh, well, not only is that not what God tells us to do, but people who have tried that found, guess what? There is also evil in us. And it always comes out. It's easy for us to blame everything on the world but that's not where sin lies solely. It's also in us. Uh, when Israel was sent into exile, Babylon was just about as pagan as you could be. And Nebuchadnezzar was an evil man. And their plan when they brought the exiles there, if you remember the book of Daniel, was to change the Israelites to become like them. They dressed them like that. They gave them different names. They fed them different food, and it didn't really work that way. Uh, but it didn't change the plan that God had. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 7, and this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Okay, an evil, evil place. He says, pray for them. Even though we live in a world as, as aliens and sojourners, uh, travelers just going through this place, uh, even though there's a danger, 
that the worldly desires, we would pick up on that and we would incorporate that into our own lives. God still says, don't fail to give honor and respect to the leaders that I have brought forth. Not an easy lesson. Peter points out to us in verse 12, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that they wouldn't speak against you as evildoers. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. He continues this same thought in our passage in verse 15. He says, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put silence to the ignorance of foolish people. So Peter says, you don't silence these attacks against you by words. You do it by doing right. Our greatest vulner vulnerability in evangelism and the greatest accusation against believers is our own despicable behavior. You've seen that. Time and time again when a Christian leader falls, the media is only too ready to jump upon it. Uh, John MacArthur tells a story of one of his elders coming to him, and he had uh, invited one of the leaders to their church. And the leader said, I would never go to that church. And the elder was stunned, and he said, why not? He says, because he named a guy, he says, he is the most crooked lawyer in this city. And he goes to that church. John MacArthur, the next Sunday, he told him, he says, I don't know the name of the lawyer, but I'm telling you, whoever you are, either change your ways or please don't tell people you come here. <laughs> but it's a message for each of us. We're to live in this world in a way that non-believers see Christ in us. Uh, and in our lives. And the idea is not only would they would stop attacking us when they see that, but they themselves would come to Christ through the example that we set. The greatest evangelism tool is not the evangelism explosion or the Roman road or some five-step program. It's a godly life lived among non-believers. And yet Jesus' words ring with me. You know, he warns you that the cares of the world and the love of riches would, would stop the word. We still got to do it. It's a danger. We're commanded to do it. It's like, it's like you're sent on a dangerous mission behind enemy lines, and you know that at any moment you might be captured. But you still go because you're commanded to do it. And that's the way it is with, with us. Uh, I want you to think of nurses. Okay, I love nurses. Nurses, how many nurses you got in here? Raise your hand if you're a nurse. I can't see because the lights are blinding me. Okay, there's some hands. Uh, they give great care. Okay, not only physically, but sometimes mentally, emotionally. Uh, I see nurses as substitute mothers. Okay, think, think of your mother when you were a kid and you were sick. Didn't matter how contagious you were. Didn't matter what, what it might do to them. They were always there to take care of you. They were there to take care of you. And nurses, they do the same thing. I mean, it's a, it's a really high calling. And this is how we got to see our lives. No matter how contagious the world is with sin, we're commanded to go out there to give the example of Christ and live our lives in such a way that people see Christ through us and in us. And just as nurses take precautions, sometimes wearing gowns or masks or gloves, we're to use precautions by staying in Scripture, by constantly staying in prayer and being in a brotherhood of brothers and sisters who will keep us straight who won't be afraid to come to us when we go astray and point that out to us. Peter's saying the same thing that Paul wrote in Romans 13.1. He says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, 
for there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed, and those who res resist will incur judgment. Uh, when I was doing a pastoral prayer, I often, most of the time, prayed for the president. I would pray for him by name, and I would pray for government leaders. And I was criticized for that one time by a member of our church. And this was for a former president who had more liberal views than he liked. And he says, how can you pray for that man? And the answer is that God commands us to do that and to show them respect because it is God who has elevated them to that office. So whether you like the president and the leaders or not, God's command for us is clear. So that means even if the president is somebody you can't stand, totally disagree with, don't even think they got there into their office uh, legally, as people in the world under the, under the civil law and under the authority, we are to honor and respect them, to live in a humble and submissive way uh, in the midst of this terrible world that we live in. That's not what I see in the news and on social media. It's not what I see Christians doing. We need to change. Uh, our submission to authorities is an act of submission to God. Just like our submission to teachers, to police officers, to anyone, to parents. God has placed them over us. Uh, whether they make good decisions or not, we are to submit and treat them with honor. And the idea is that you can look a president, a governor, even an IRS agent in the eye if you totally disagree with them and say that I submit to you and I honor you because God has elevated you to this position over me. Is that easy? Not at all. Um, and this same thought covers through the rest of the passage. Uh, it's that we are to live also in a servanthood to God and to others. Verse 16 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. In fact, Peter writes in verse 17, Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So our life living as the chosen people of God, living as this holy nation, this royal priesthood, involves us serving not only God, but serving other people. I got to confess, I like to be served. We're a, we're a people that like to be served. If you have to wait at Walmart or at the doctor's office or at the dentist or the traffic light, you don't like it. And you sometimes complain about the service. But we're the ones who are to serve. What do we call this here when we meet on Sunday? It's a worship service, not a worship entertainment. Okay, uh, we come to serve God and to serve others. So, I was visiting somebody and I was talking to this mother who had a teenage daughter who was watching something on TV, and, and while in the middle of our conversation, the daughter says, Mom, I need a drink of water. Do you know what the correct response is? Is your leg broke? Okay. Uh, that's our mentality. And you know it's true. I guarantee you, you have much more joy in serving others that you have and others serving you. And we've just been so programmed that it's hard for us to imagine. 
Listen to Moses' plea to Pharaoh, and he said this several times. He says, let my people go that they may serve God in the wilderness. Uh, Galatians 5.15, Paul writes, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Uh, can you see how this is all a part of what is called life evangelism? Uh, we serve others as if we are serving the Lord. Uh, we show them an unselfish life of service in order to win them to Christ. We have a tradition. We started here about three or four years ago. It's called Serve Day. And I know it's only one day a year, but hopefully the community sees us getting our hands dirty. No benefits to us, just to serve. Uh, I think that's pleasing to God. Uh, and we can best serve people by showing them that love of Christ. Uh, it's a great tool for the non-believer because the non-believer sees you taking somebody to the doctor, he sees you taking them food, visiting them in the hospital, cleaning up their yard, and they're saying, wow, that's, that's really love. And for the believer, it shows, we see that and we say, maybe I shouldn't just be sitting here on the bench or the pew, maybe I should be doing that too. And so it's really a great example for everyone. So I'm going to give you an example of that. When my wife was in ICU for a week, two of my friends came and stayed in the waiting room all week. Have you ever sat someplace like that for a week? That's painful, okay? But they were there just in case I needed something. And, and I appreciated that. But let me tell you, go beyond that. There were several other people in that waiting room waiting for their loved ones. And they got to talking. Why are you here? Why are you here? They heard what they were doing, and that was such an example to them. They listened to the gospel, and they were able to present the gospel to a number of people while they were sitting there. That's why we serve. That's why we show the love of Christ to one another to even to people we don't know. Um, that's how we serve people. Um, that's what's called living a life of service. The third part in Peter's passage today is, is understanding that we're called to suffer, we're called to sorrows. Uh, you look at verses 20 and 21. And Peter writes, When you do good and suffer for it, you endure this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Uh, we're called not only to obey Christ, we're called to imitate him. And we all suffer in life, whether it be physical or mental or emotional. And I'm going to confess to you, it's hard to get excited and say, oh boy, another opportunity to serve God by suffering. We don't like to suffer. Yet it finds us that we've been called to do that. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ. Uh, Peter reminds us of Jesus' reaction to suffering. He, uh, he unjustly suffered Verse 23 says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He lived under injustice his entire life, yet he never attacked a government. He said, render unto Caesar that which was Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. He never attacked the rulers of those in authority. He never led a protest or a civil disobedience. He never led a demonstration against the Roman abuses. Uh, he didn't walk around with a sign that said, Impeach Herod, or he's not my king. Uh, 
He never even protested when they violated their own law at his trial. And they did in several ways. He never protested. As was a, as a, was a lamb, was sly, silent while being sheared, so Christ was silent. Because he trusted, he trusted in his Father, who was always just, who always has a perfect plan. And I know we can't see God's plan. When we suffer, when bad things happen, it's hard. And it's hard for us to understand, why did this happen? But we know without any doubt, because... It's in his word. God is faithful and true. He is all good. He is perfect, and his plans are always perfect. So even though we don't know and don't understand, we trust just as Jesus did. He called sinners to repent. He called them to come to him and enter his kingdom. And he simply kept trusting his father. He died a horrible, agonizing death with our sins placed upon him. And that hurt much more than the physical punishment. And verse 24 says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds you have been healed. So what do you do when you're driving and somebody cuts you off? What if they call you a bad name or give you some rude hand signal? Um, do you respond in kind? Peter says, follow the example set by Christ. Do we do that with the leaders we don't like? People who offend us? Do we have an attitude of serving the Lord and others? Do we trust God when we have to suffer? God calls us to take whatever comes our way, to accept his plan, to use it for his glory, uh, showing everyone around us, both believers and unbelievers, that we trust in him and that we are here as his servants that only purpose, to bring glory to his name, to point others to him. And it requires a mindset that's hard to get. Our life is for Christ. Um, he's in absolute control. Our lives are to be ones of submission, ones of servanthood, and ones of even suffering. And I will confess to you, this has been a very hard message for me as I prepared it because I have been severely convicted of some of the things I do and say and think. And I hope that you are too. And what a perfect time that today is the day that we share in the table of the Lord. Elders, I would ask you to come forward as, as we prepare this is a, a special time. <laughs> uh, it's a time of repentance. It's a time for us, if you've been convicted of anything, to go to the Lord and to, and to ask his forgiveness and ask his help in changing us. This table is, is not a Presbyterian table. It's a table for all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're visiting with us, if you have another church, we welcome you to participate. But I will say that it is a table for believers. And if you're not a believer, uh, I would ask you to refrain. Uh, it would be wise to do that. Uh, our, our desire would be that this very day that the Lord would convict you 
And this would be the day that you would come into the family of God by believing in our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so I, as I minister the gospel, I set aside these elements from a common and ordinary use to a holy and a sacred use. And uh, let us go to the Lord now with a time of prayer and a time of confession as we prepare our hearts to sup at this table. Lord Jesus, uh, we are a sinful lot. We have evil thoughts and evil words and evil deeds, and we have sinned by doing the things you have forbidden. And we have sinned by not doing the things you have commanded. Lord, it is only by your grace that we're here today. It is only by your grace that the earth does not open up and swallow us up. And we ask, Lord, now that each of us would take a moment and pray to you themselves in a silent that you might hear us. Lord tells us that when we repent of our sins and ask forgiveness that he removes them from us as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. That